<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Vivia Pallavi Ramya, and I, I'm an ENT registrar at the University of Cape Town. Today, I'll be presenting case reports on nasal vestibulitis. The aim of this presentation is to highlight how important early diagnosis and treatment of nasal vestibulitis is important, and also to showcase how a nasal vestibulitis can present in complicated forms. Uh, these are my disclaimers. Patient consent was obtained and my contents are referenced. So starting with case one, a 28 year old male came to um, the emergency department complaining of pain and swelling over his nasal tip, frontal headache and fever for the past two days. He's known with a history of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps for the past five years and for which he is on treatment. However, his medications ran out two weeks ago and he was therefore constantly rubbing his nose with his handkerchief. On post-surgical history, he's had a septoplasty in 2019 and he reports of no allergy. On examination, he had a blood pressure of 127 by 79, a pulse of 107 beats per minute, and a temperature of 40 degrees. His systemic examination was normal. He had a GCS of 15 by 15 with no signs of meningism. On eye examination, he had mild chemosis and ptosis in his left eye. However, his visual acuity, color vision, and eye movements were normal bilaterally. On nasal examination, he had an erythematous nasal tip, and on rhinoscopy, there was crust in his nasal vestibule, but normal turbinates, normal mucosa, and no polyps observed. As part of his investigation, blood workup was done where an elevated white cell count of 15.8 was noted. He had normal hemoglobin, platelets, urea, and electrolytes. His blood culture, however, grew a Staphylococcus aureus. A contrasted CT brain was ordered in order to rule out any cavernous sinus, and this was ruled out on CT scan. Hence, this was the case of nasal vestibulitis complicated by septicemia. He was treated with IV cloxacillin, 2 grams 6 hourly for 14 days, alongside with oxymetazole nasal drops, fluticasone, propropionate nasal spray, and nasal douches. Coming to case two, a 28-year-old female presented to the emergency department complaining of sore throat, painful swallowing, facial swelling, and nasal crusting for the past five days. She's newly diagnosed HIV with a CD4 count of 150. She has no past surgical history, no allergic history, and is a non-alcoholic and non-smoker. On examination, she had a temperature of 38.5 degrees Celsius, a BP of 80 by 64, and a pulse of 130, and she was noted to be mildly dehydrated. On her facial examination, she had mid-face swelling, as you can see here, with bilateral swollen and tendered parotids. On ear examination, she had bilateral edematous ear canal and otoria. Her nasal endoscopy revealed inflammation and sloughing of the alanazi and crust in the vestibule. There was no polyp and there was mild adenoid tissue found in the nasal pharynx. A contrasted CT brain and neck was ordered urgently. And here on the sagittal view, we noticed there was a retropharyngeal collection. And here on actual view, we noted that there was bilateral maxillary sinus opacification. As you can see here. And on the coronal view, alongside with the bilateral maxillary sinus opacification, we noted bilateral sphenoid sinus opacification. She was then booked for emergency theater where an incision and drainage of the retropharynx was done. However, there was only all blood found. Bilateral middle meatal antrostomy and sphenoidotomy was done and the pus was sent for uh, microscopic culture and sensitivity. Mm -hmm. 
the post-nasal space lymphoid tissue was biopsied. On ear examination, it was noted that she had edematous ear canal but a normal tympanic membrane. As part of her blood workup, her, she was found to have an acute kidney injury. Her urea was 27, her creatinine was 617. She had a high white cell count of 51.7, a low hemoglobin of 7.1, and platelets of 277. Her blood culture was negative after five days. Her pus grew no acid pus bacilli, no bacterial organisms, and no fungi. The post-nasal space biopsy just revealed an inflammatory tissue. And hence, this was a case of nasal vestibulitis complicated with septic shock. She required ICU admission after surgery. And on day two, she unfortunately went, uh, developed pulmonary edema to her acute uh, kidney injury, and it, she required dialysis. On day three, she was off inotropes and extubated. On day four, she developed candida on urine culture. And on day five, she was discharged from ICU to the ward, where unfortunately she had two temperature spikes. A septic workup was done. Her blood culture was negative. Her white cell count had improved from 51 to 11. Her hemoglobin was eight and platelets 300. Her chest X-ray also showed marked improvement. She was from the start started on IV keftriaxone, two grams, 12 hourly, and IV flagyl, 500 milligrams, eight hourly for a week. Nasal douches, autotopicals, oxymetazole in nasal drops, and fluticasone propionate nasal spray was also added in as part of her treatment. For the course of the one week, we noticed marked improvement in facial swelling, as well as the press and the nasal ala had markedly improved. Coming to case three, a 17-year-old female presented to emergency department with nasal tipped redness, facial swelling, and fever for two days after reporting trauma with a tennis racket. She says she did bleed after the trauma, but it had resolved. But uh, thereafter, she would prick her nose repeatedly to remove the dry blood. She has a past medical history of being newly diagnosed with HIV and has a CD4 count of 15. She has no past surgical history, no allergic history, and she's a non-alcoholic, but a smoker and reports using five cigarettes a day. On examination, her blood pressure was 114 by 80. She had a pulse of 127 and a temperature of 36.3. She had a normal systemic examination with no signs of meningism. Her face was, however, edematous and had, she had bilateral preceptal uh, cellulitis. Her visual acuity, color vision, and eye movements was normal bilaterally. On nasal examination, she had an erythematous swollen nasal tip and on rhinoscopy, crust was noted in the vestibule, but there was no septal hematoma, no bleeding, and no, a normal nasopharynx. Blood, CT scan, and an ophthalmologic consult was done. The ophthalmologic consult ruled out any intracranial uh, signs of uh, raised pressure and just uh, reported a bilateral septal cellulitis. On investigations, the blood workup showed a raised white cell count of 20.1, hemoglobin of 11.8, and platelets of 300. She had, however, a raised CRP of 144. And that is her contrasted CT brain, which showed bilateral superior ophthalmic vein thrombosis. As you can see here, the superior ophthalmic veins are dilated and thrombosed. And hence, this is a case of nasal vestibulitis complicated by superior ophthalmic vein thrombosis. She was started on treatment of IV keftriaxone, two grams, 12 hourly, and IV flagyl, 500 milligrams, eight hourly for a week, alongside with nasal douches, oxymetazole in nasal drops, and fluticasone propionate nasal spray. Throughout the course of the week, her nasal symptoms and facial swelling had markedly improved, there was no vestibular crust and normal mucosa was observed. And even the redness at the tip of her nose 
had resolved. So let us have a look at what is nasal vestibulitis. This has many names in, reported in literature, ranging from nasal furunculosis, nasal vestibular folliculitis, but they essentially all mean Basically, if it's a nasal furuncle, a localized painful area of cellulitis surrounding a hair follicle, and a nasal vestibulitis is more of a diffuse process and is associated with crusting. The most common organism causing nasal vestibulitis is Staphylococcus aureus. There are risk factors reported. So in immunocompromised patients who are HIV positive or who have diabetes mellitus, those who habitually nose prick their nose, hair pluck, or there's nasal trauma, those with frequent nose blowing, or even foreign body in children, one must suspect nasal vestibulitis. Those on cancer treatment, those with systemic conditions, such as systemic lupus erythematosus, and those with herpes simplex or herpes zoster and TD. The clinical presentations of nasal vestibulitis varies, from a localized site of crusting to a localized cellulitis over the nose to a mid phase cellulitis over the nose or to a vestibular abscess with frank pus pointing pimple. On examination, there are two phases noted, an acute phase where one notes redness, swelling and liquid secretion in the nasal vestibule and a chronic phase where the skin hardening fissuring and crusting. There's a designated sign known as the Rudolph sign following Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer, where one notice intense tender unilateral erythema at the nasal tip. One must proceed to do a full blood count, pus and CNS if there's a frank pus being discharged and an HbA1c to rule out diabetes. The treatment in mild cases includes warm compress, topical antiseptics, such as fistic acid or mipirosin. Gentle cleaning of nasal crust is to be carried out. For moderate and severe infections, IV systemic antibiotics against staph is preferable, either amoxicillin or cloxacillin, and drainage is to be done if there's frank abscess. One must note that complications that can result uh, can occur from a nasal vestibulitis includes intranasal abscess, facial cellulitis, meningitis, and cavernous sinus thrombosis. And the reason why cavernous sinus thrombosis occurs is because of the danger area of the face, which extends from the upper corners of the upper lip to the nose, including the maxilla. The venous drainage in this area is by two parts. Firstly, it can be by the deep facial vein, through the pterygoid plexus and via the inferior ophthalmic vein to the cavernous sinus, or it can be via the facial vein through the angular veins and the superior ophthalmic vein to the cavernous sinus. As a reminder, just a brief anatomy on cavernous sinus thrombosis. It's there are paired trabeculated sinuses lateral to the sphenoid sinus, and they're traversed in the lateral wall by the oculomotor trochlea ophthalmic and maxillary nerve. Internally running in the sinus is the internal carotid artery and abducens nerve. And these sinuses drain to the superior and inferior petrosal sinuses. One must remember that these are valveless tubal sinuses, which means there's bidirectional flow. The clinical presentation of cavernous sinus thrombosis is most commonly uh, the patient reports of headache, which is uh, more with orbital and eye signs, which rapidly progress within 24 to 48 hours, unilateral to bilateral. The complaint of orbital pain, chemosis, ptosis, diplopia, cranial nerve 3, 4, 6, and 5 fall out, specifically V1 and V2. There's also decreased pupillary responses and dilated pupil with loss of accommodation reflexes. In severe cases, it could also be intracranial complications such as meningitis and brain abscess. Ideally, one should order for a contrasted CT scan where one would see an increased density in cavernous sinus with filling defects, and they may or may not see a dilated ophthalmic vessels. An MRV it can also be ordered. 
as part of treatment, early aggressive broad spectrum antibiotics is to be started, and this includes third generation cephalosporin, metronidazole, and antistaphylococcal penicillin for a minimum of two weeks, but it can be extended to six weeks. The reason why one should continue antibiotic treatment, even though clinically the signs have resolved, is because the bacteria within the thrombus may not be killed until the dual sinus recanalizes. And of course, one must treat the underlying cause of the cavernous sinus thrombosis. Regarding anticoagulation, it has been found in literature that antibiotics in combination with anticoagulation reduces morbidity associated with blindness, stroke, and ophthalmoplegia. There is a debate regarding steroids. Should we give steroids? Though the benefit of steroids includes decreased orbital inflammation, renal nerve edema, vasogenic edema, one must weigh the adverse effects of corticosteroids as they have potential immunosuppressive effects and pro-thrombotic properties. And hence, steroids should only be given in cases of Addison's uh, adrenal insufficiency. Therefore, some take-home messages. One must never squeeze a nasal furuncle as there's risk of retrograde thrombophobitis. One must never prematurely incise and drain a nasal furuncle. Rather, wait for the furuncle to mature and to have a, a pus pointing sign where then we can incise and drain. Topical mucoricin, oral antibiotics, and gentle mopping can be attempted, and one must always warn the patients of the danger symptoms when they come back, for them to come back to hospital. In the end, early diagnosis and aggressive treatment is mandatory to prevent complications. These are my references. Thank you for your kind attention. Thanks, Tobias. That's a really outstanding presentation. Well, yeah. uh, let us ask uh, the issue about anti regulation. Mm -hmm. It's controversial. It's very controversial in literature. Yeah. So they say um, there is up to date, um, and, uh, and they say that it's always preferable to start anticoagulation, except in cases where there's intracerebral bleeding, that one should always weigh the risks versus the benefits for the patients. Yeah. What do you do in Pittsburgh? We typically will start by an easy coagulation. Um, we do. Usually, I have a drill. What components do you have? Most of it is uh, based on the patient, and uh, as well in the literature, they support the, uh, uh, the use of, those who support the use of uh, instrumentation, both of uh, uh, continuous uh, flow. In, the cavernous sinus without the penetration of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So, if you do not start uh, um, population is steady, then the penetration of antibiotics is really poor. Okay, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. Uh, and then and you practice. Mm -hmm. So, I also want to start. For me, this is in the yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Um, uh, you have asked Nadi. Hi, Prof. Hi, hi. <laughs> Can you hear me, Shavi? Um, Davia? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, that's a really great presentation. There's not much for me to add. I think you've kind of uh, covered all bases. I think one must just have um, kind of a low threshold to kind of admit these patients and start uh, start treatment early. And as you said, the most important thing is not to pick on those uh, for the patients, not to pick on those lesions, but also for the doctors not to um, kind of incise and drain those areas unless they're on uh, antibiotic cover, you know, because uh, the surgical intervention can, can also cause that retrograde spread of infection. Um, but I think it's you know, regarding anticoagulation. I think you know we we don't start uh, um, anticoagulation for a superior ophthalmic vein thrombosis, and I've checked with Hamsa as well. Um, they don't advise it, but I think as as soon as we have a cavernous sinus thrombosis um, and there's no contraindications, I think it is worthwhile to start therapeutic levels of clexane. Um, and only to consider not doing it if the patient's high risk for kind of intracranial bleed or other problems. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah. Are there any other comments? <clears throat> Um, all right, thank you for your attendance and we'll see you next week on Wednesday. <clears throat>